Sorry about that. You test both your voices. Can you hear me now too? Yes, I can definitely hear you, Joe. I'm so excited. Right. Fantastic. Can we hear you fine. Oh, perfect. So without further ado, I'll do a little bit of a intro about the both of you. Uh, thank you and welcome to Anahita TV. And I'm so excited to have both Madison Madden and Guru Bai, uh, Joe Rich on here. Uh, I'll do a little in it, um, uh, a little in it, why am I blanking out, uh, introduction on uh, Joe. He's a yogi, Ayurvedic chef. He's got 20 years of experience in teaching Kundalini Yoga. He's the founder and pioneer of the Pacific Coast Ayurveda uh, and uh, Institute uh, and applied uh, Center for Applied Consciousness, International Institute of Tantric and Vedic Science. He has a degree in healthcare management. He has a background in counseling. He's worked with emotionally disturbed inner city children and youth. And uh, he's, had, uh, he's also run homes with at-risk youth. And also he worked as an epidemiologist for the CDC. I'm so excited to have Guru Bai here because his mission is uh, I hear loud noises. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it's a dog. <laughs> no. uh, his uh, mission is to help everyday people uh, apply consciousness to everyday life. Did I get it or did I miss anything? That sounds, that sounds way too good for me, but <laughs> you're always modest. I'll try to live up to that uh, introduction. <laughs> well, you're gonna have to try. I'm kidding. <laughs> you're yeah, ready. Really. I'm ready. <laughs> and Madison also, she's an Ayurvedic doctor, therapeutic movement specialist, and co-founder of Pacific Coast Ayurveda and Root Down Retreat. Her specialties include Panchakarma. Marma therapy, women, women's reproductive health, and healing with food. Her expertise is rooted in the connection and manifestation of mental, emotional patterns in physical body. Um, born and raised in Colorado, and was chronically ill and uh, as a child, and uh, which meant this is. Uh, you know, she she went through the natural healing process, and this is uh, why she's doing what she does, which is helping others recover. Uh, did I get that right, or can you correct me if I'm wrong? That's perfect. It's all good. <laughs> well, thank you so much, both of you, for uh, being on this uh, live with me today. Um, one we of wish you was in person. We wish you were here with us. Oh, yeah. I wish I was there. I wish I was, you know, I love Galala where you guys moved to. Uh, for the audience, just to let you know, uh, both Madison and uh, Joe lived where I live in uh, Los Angeles area and their offices were at the Calabasas uh, area city. And that's where I used, where I met you guys. And then you guys moved to Galala. Can you tell us why and how? <laughs> it's far from here, but it's beautiful. Short story is that we wanted to be outside the city. We wanted to be in a more a place that has more of a balance of elements um, outside the freneticism of the city. We wanted to be in a place that we could bring people to heal and learn where they were outside the craziness and disease factors of the metropolitan area. So we're in a really beautiful small town north of San Francisco, about three hours, right on the coast. And we have our clinic and studio, and we're starting a school up here now. Oh, what kind of school? Uh, Ayurveda. Ayurveda school. Oh, so you teach other uh, people who want to follow in your footsteps and become yeah, train, well, train practitioners. Yeah, and Panchakarma therapists. Congratulations! I didn't know about that. <laughs> I know you're going to be our first student. Oh yeah, I would love to. <laughs> I would love Great. that. I'm open to that. You know that, Joe. <laughs> um, so I'll send you a special invitation. Oh, yay. With gold leafing. Has to flowers. Lots of flowers. <laughs> okay, thank you. I would appreciate it. You don't have to do that. You know I'll be there. Um, we wanted to do the topic with, today about uh, the divine feminine. 
um, I took your class, uh, for my audiences to know, you guys have Zoom retreat classes on Saturday mornings that run for three hours. And uh, I was lucky enough to sit in or join for the Divine Feminine and I was moved. I wrote a little article that I sent to you guys. And, uh, yeah, and I wanted to share that with my audience. Um, I feel like there's such an imbalance and you guys hit on so many amazing topics uh, that were under the Divine Feminine. So without further ado, um, go ahead. I, I, whoever wants to go first, uh, let's start from the beginning. Because <laughs> um, right now we're in such a masculine driven society. Tell us about the shift. Um, do you guys feel that there's a shift? Well, um, yogically speaking, we are in a natural shift from what was deemed as the Piscean Age to the Aquarian Age. And the Piscean Age was natural, it was a masculine dominated time. And the Aquarian Age is a time in which the masculine and feminine polarities are supposed to come more into equality. Wow. Um, so we're, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the fall of the Piscean Age in a lot of different ways, economically, politically, socially, you know, in all of our major systems, um, environmentally, we're seeing the results of the Piscean Age. Um, one of the best ways to see it is through the destruction of the environment. And then you can see that, you know, that macrocosm and pretty much all the microcosms in business and health and, you know, all sorts of different ways. So um, a lot of what we do and a lot of what we focus on is the relationship between the masculine and the feminine and the way that that plays out both in relationship to the self, relationship to others, and relationship to one's work and service and you know, the larger world. So in the Aquarian age, it's supposed to come back more into equality. In our practice, Kundalini Yoga, um, the feminine principle is, or the divine feminine, is 16 times as powerful as the feminine or as the masculine. And so the feminine has this natural capacity to um, create and to lead and to serve. Um, and that is not to say that the masculine doesn't play a role and doesn't play a vital role. It's not, we don't, what we want to be careful of is not reversing the dynamic that we've been seeing for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, where the feminine plays a, you know, submissive subordinate role um, and the masculine plays a dominant role. We want to see a equality there where the feminine comes into power and comes into a rising position, um, but doesn't try to squash or, um, you know, dominate in a, um, in a way that pushes aside or does not value or respect the quality of the masculine. I love that. I love how it feels like finally we're going to have some ease because I think the way things are going right now, it's just the separation is, is tremendously stressful for both sexes, not just for the woman. I think uh, for the masculine to be separated from the feminine, that's also painful for him. Can you touch on that, Joe? So what you're talking about there is polarity versus duality. So in the present day, you're feeling the duality where the masculine is trying to dominate the feminine and suppress the voice. And the coming time where you'll, you'll see is that the polarity between the two is actually something that's a positive. And that when you bring those things together, it creates a third that's far more powerful than the individuals could ever create on their own. So if you can get away from thinking about the fact that you're different from me is something I should be afraid of or is a problem between us and start saying that the fact that you're different from me is perfect because we're both pieces of a puzzle and it's the puzzle that we're concerned with. We need the puzzle to come into full focus so that we can have a holistic life and that you fulfill one role and I fulfill the other. If I don't have you, then I'm, I'm not ever going to get to my highest consciousness if you don't have me, then, you know, you won't. And, and that doesn't, we're talking about masculine and feminine. It's not male, female. So every body has a masculine and feminine side. So that can be, that polarity is present 
um, even between two men or two women, or between a man and a woman, and, and yet it can flip-flop. The man can fulfill the, what would be more typical of the female role, where he might be the nurturer of the children while you know, she goes to work, instead of the traditional where he goes off to work. And so all of that's possible under this dynamic. So don't get caught on the words you know, feminine and masculine as though that, that is something separate. You have both inside of you and whether you balance that inside of you or not is also another issue. It's not just the external balance, but the internal balance uh, within each person. That so makes polarity, sense. In our practice, polarity is a good thing. It's not considered a problem. So that's the big difference. So polarity is what we want. Duality is the one that we are in now. Yes. Where you stay separate and that's an issue. Yeah. Polarity is you recognize your differences and you bring them together into a unified wholeness. Yeah. You respect in each other's differences and work with them together to create well, a whole. And value them because value, yeah. you're going to bring me something that I don't, I'm maybe not aware of. Mm -hmm. I haven't brought myself to a self-awareness of you bring that to me. That com helps complete my picture. So it's not just... I need you. I have to understand that I need you. I need the feminine or masculine polarity, depending on where I'm at at any given time. So, you know, it's, it's a need. It's not just a, a tolerance at all. Yeah. It's, it's, it's understanding that it was created this way on purpose. And that, you know, they always say that racism is because people fear the unknown. But so we could say that about sexism. If I keep fearing you because you're different than me, and then how can I get, you know, how can I union with you? And the idea of the word yoga means to union. It doesn't mean to do asanas, it means to union. And so I need to union with your polarity. I need to be here, not, I don't need to just tolerate, I need to union with you. And, um, we need to stop thinking of each other as separate. This, we're all one. Ekon Kar in our practice means we are all one with the divine. So when we're in our divine self, in our soulful self, not our personalities, but our human bodies, but the soulful self, then we can union with one another and end division and end this du I, the concept of duality has to go away now. So what are some basic concepts, basic ways, like let's say as a woman, I'm not in my feminine energy. What is the best way to start for a woman? And then maybe you guys can touch up after what is the best way a man can begin um, honing his, um, his powers where that he accepts the woman as who she is or and vice versa. Sure. Um, okay, so we have a couple of really big ones. So the feminine in our culture has assumed the position of the performer a lot or the pleaser, right? So a big transition here is to go from the pleaser to the pleased. And by that, I mean, um, we call it, you know, the lover and the beloved we often talk about. Um, or going from the commanded to the commander. That's a really big one, a big one for a woman. That's very challenging um, for a woman because they're assuming that submissive subordinate role is a very um, natural subconscious thing for most women. And, and obviously this is not a universal thing, but it's a very um, common cultural undercurrent. And so the transition, which is a self-anointed process, nobody can do that for you. Nobody can tell you, do this and, you know, you'll be fine and you'll be great. You know, people can do that and it's not going to work. It has to be a self-created process saying, you know what? I'm no longer going to be the performer or the pleaser. I am going to assume the role, the responsibility of taking leadership, taking responsibility, voicing my creative ideas. I'm going to command the world in front of me rather than feel like a victim of my circumstances. Mm. Wow. That's so yeah, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, so one of the important things in that that we teach is that if a man's going to fulfill his destiny, then he needs, he needs the, the feminine. So again, it could be within himself, 
Or if he chooses a partner, a fem female partner, and she embodies that for him, he needs her to project him into his infinite consciousness. So the woman really in our practice and our way of thinking is the commander of the ship. So if you think of a family, you know, a typical American family, man or wife and two kids or something like that, and white picket fence and the dog. Mm -hmm. she, she pretty much steers the course of the family, you know, and sets the tone within the house of the family. And all of that, in all of that, she needs to project her husband or the man into his infinite consciousness and, and keep him on course so he doesn't uh, lose, lose his focus in life. On the other hand, it, okay, so to do that, to do that, sometimes she's gonna have to confront him. We, we, we say in our, to, to teach Kundalini Yoga, you need to be able to poke, provoke, confront, and then ultimately uplift. But there's that poking and poking, poking and, and confronting can sometimes feel like criticism, right? And we all know, I, I think any woman listening to this knows that men usually have a pretty fragile evil, ego. And um, so in that exchange, the man can sometimes feel criticized or something. And, and if that happens, then he may start to push back. Um, and then the woman becomes insecure because now she's being criticized when she's trying to help. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't feel too good, like understandably. So um, the agreement between the, the masculine and the feminine, whether it's within you or externally um, in a relationship with, the, with a female, is that I give you permission to push me. I give you permission to poke me and provoke me and confront me because I know that the intention is to, is to uplift me. And I want that. On the other hand, I promise that I won't make you insecure. So I won't threaten you. I won't uh, say I'll divorce you or I'm going to separate from you. Or, you know, when you get into extreme behaviors like physical harm, you know, where people become abusive, all of that has to be eliminated up front in your agreement so that the woman feels that she can go ahead and, and do her thing and help you. And you, on the other hand, will keep her safe. And so she has the security to do that. And in that agreement, you find out, you find a lot of things that Madison was just referring to. She has to bring sometimes the spark. She has to initiate the conversation. And again, it could feel a little bit critical, um, but she, she has to bring that to the relationship. She can't remain the silent, submissive woman is just like, whatever you want, honey, you know, that, that's got to go. I mean, that's, that's, that's a not, that's a non, that's a, you can't even begin that in this practice. That's got to already be eliminated. So. One of the things you commonly see in relationships is, you know, the common nagging sound of a woman, an unhappy woman, right? So oftentimes women will think that they are confronting or they're taking charge or they're taking leadership through nagging. And that is not the case. There's actually still a submissiveness in that. There's still, you know, you're, there's a resentment that builds over the course of time from not actually taking a director role, right? And then over time, you just start nagging at, you know, this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong, as opposed to learning and becoming someone who can inspire and inspire change and inspire direction and you know, inspire creative spark in a relationship, even if that requires confrontation. That's wonderful. That's a lot of uh, great information. Um, you're right. Like, it, you know, I think television always shows the woman as the natter and uh, the guy, you know, like I, I look at sitcoms. I feel like sitcoms are just have been, you know, they're funny, et cetera, but very horrific at showing family life because they show the man as being this bumbling idiot all the time. He's wrong no matter what he does. And right. he's everything where, um, not in, in the way that you're saying it, but in a hateful way, in a resentful way. She is, um, she's smart, but then she's always winning. And I think that that has created some kind of separation, a separation in our society where right. men think, oh, I, you know, she's a strong woman. I, you know, that's why a lot of strong women are single. I feel like uh, because, <laughs> you know, uh, 
they they scare you know society kind of scares men of those types of women who are smart who are educated have a lot going on um in in their life but then uh and then they showcase women usually half naked on the magazine they usually don't look like a woman who has had children they yeah. like 12 year old boys <laughs> that's <laughs> you know with no body fat just very unrealistic yeah. right yeah that's and that's what we mean by a performer right it's, yeah 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 they're trying to hold they're trying to hold us in the stereotypes and because a submissive person in general is controllable by male or female if you if you but if you it's one thing to sur to be surrendered but it's another thing to be submissive and um a submissive person who doesn't speak them their self, you know, they don't bring themselves forward. They don't feel like they have anything to offer. They don't feel that creative urge or spark in life. Once that's once that's diminished or, or foul, then we're controllable, and that's so our society likes that. We go to work, we pay our taxes, and we keep our mouth shut, and so we end up where we are, right? With the environment collapsing, we have viruses you know, killing us, and we have absolutely no leadership in our society to help bring us together to, to, uh, to solve these problems. And so, you know, they keep us divided. And you know, the old saying, divide and divide conquer. And conquer. And, um, I always say this, oh my God. And yeah. the word humanity has the word unity in there. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Unity. Unity. That, that's the key, you know, we got to hold hands. And, uh, I, you know, we need strong women. So <laughs> I'm sorry if, if men can't handle you, but you still need to become strong. And, and uh, maybe when there's enough of that, the men will just get so lonely that they'll step up anyway. So yeah, it's just, there's the, I, I, yeah, especially in Southern California, there's a lot of uh, men who are in their 40s, but they act like little boys. Yeah. Wow. Responsibility. They've never had families, never yeah. been in a relationship more than a year. And, and, and they're wondering why they're wondering why they don't question themselves and their habits um yeah. I feel like uh, the porn kind of the society the free porn that's that's kind of ruined everything is that am i wrong because like if they get lonely they just turn on the computer you know and then um i've talked to a couple of pastors believe it or not and they're saying one of the major issues with marriages even marriages are having issues are that men are not having sex with their wives because they're pleasing themselves and then they have nothing left for the wife. I, I remember, Joe, you said something about um, sexuality and, you know, men, women. Can you uh, touch up on that, please? Well, you know, I just want to go back. I was just listening. There's a, what's his name, Jahan Hardy. He's a, he's a guy who wrote a book about depression. I just want to comment on what you just said at first. And that we're the loneliest, this is the loneliest time in, in our society, in the history of, of mankind. This is the loneliest time. Really? And it's, it's because of everything you just said. And, you know, so a man can drive around in a Corvette going bald and with his paunchy stomach at 52, trying to hit on 25 year olds, you know, on, you know, on Hollywood Boulevard. And that's all fine and dandy, but he's just as dissatisfied at the end of the day as anybody else. And, and men know that that's not what's going to make them happy. They've just given up on the hope of being happy. So they're trying to substitute sex or, you know, they're not even having sex. So it's a joke. They're not, we're having sex less than ever. We're the loneliest time where everything and depression is running rampant. And this guy, this, this hardy guy, I, I love his stuff. And, um, he wrote the book, The Con Connection, something The Connection. I'll get it, I'll get it to you. I'll anyway. put it in the title below uh, at, on the YouTube channel when you share yeah. it. Yeah, it's great. And he's just, he just keeps it simple. And I just was listening to his YouTube and he said in it, now this is back to the sexual part. He said, no, no person is, is satisfied after an hour on the porn channel as they are after an hour having sex in the flesh and blood, you know, with another person. So I, I don't care what anybody says. We're not satisfied. We're not happy. We're lonely. We're detached. It's not working. It's like trying to say the environment's okay because we're having a beautiful day today. That's not, that's not, not the truth. The scientists are trying to tell us it's not the truth. And the scientists are telling us the same thing about our sexual behaviors and everything else. 
ejaculation does not make a man happy. And so we need to stop this myth um, that is being portrayed on porn and also in, in movies and on TV and everything else. Ejaculation is not what makes a man happy. And um, that's not what sex is about. And sex is a tantric sex, which uh, Kundalini Yoga is a tantric yoga. So I don't teach tantric sex. I'm not trying to say that. We call it red tantric versus white tantric, which is what Kundalini Yoga is. So I, but I do, I do know about it. Uh, all I can tell you is that the whole idea behind tantric sex is that to take the energy and run it up the spine and have a high, actually have it affect your consciousness by stimulating the pituitary and the pineal gland with the energy of the orgasm. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with ejaculation. And that's what will make a man happy. That's what it makes a woman happy. And really it's the time before and after this act of sex that really makes you happy and because it creates union, it, it creates a feeling that you're not alone in the world and takes away loneliness. And that's what's killing all of this. And in our practice, we always say that, you know, we put it on the man now, you know, you can play with this a little bit. It's not, it's not dogma, but the man starts seducing the woman 72 hours before they actually have the act of sex. So he starts saying, you know, hey, let me send you flowers. And um, that the foreplay before you even engage in the act of sex should be at least two and a half hours long. So we actually teach that to try to undo the mythology that most young men in America, at least, I don't want to say everywhere because I haven't lived everywhere, but uh, I've been in Europe a lot. So I see it in European cultures. I see it in America where this idea is, it's just all about ejaculating and that's what brings happiness. And of course, a woman's supposed to have an orgasm in like two seconds, which every scientist in the world tells you that's absolutely not gonna happen. I think the average length of time is it takes a woman to reach orgasm is 40 minutes. Wow. And it should, uh, they really, they do now. There's a guy who wrote the book, uh, She Comes First. I'd recommend any man and woman reading that. And he highly recommends that, you know, uh, foreplay uh, would encompass or in, uh, encourages the man to give the woman oral sex. It's pretty necessary for a woman um, to reach orgasm. And so the scientists are trying to tell you about sexuality and sex and all that, just like they're trying to tell you about the climate and like everything else. But <laughs> our culture doesn't want to hear it. So they say, no, the sun's shining. It's a beautiful day. There's no such thing as an environmental problem. And the same thing is being said about the bedroom. And unfortunately, it's absolutely not true. And, um, and we can take it right into Ayurveda. We don't even have to leave it here. And we can tell you that in our clinic, especially Madison and Victor, who are the doctors on, on the front lines, I'm, I'm in the background now at my age. But one of the main causes of disease we see every day, every day is sexual dissatisfaction, especially for women. It, it leads to all kinds of diseases. And I'll turn it over to Madison to talk about that. So she's well, we often talk about the male dis or the, the sexual dysfunction in our culture being a male issue, you know, that men are addicted to porn and men don't know how to please women and men want, you know, are the sexual predators and all of those things, but women are equally, equally responsible. You know, the, the female um, sexual or the clitoris, just take the clitoris. The clitoris has many times as many nerve endings as the penis. It, the woman's ability to experience and receive pleasure far exceeds that of the man. But most women, a lot, a lot of women have never even experienced an orgasm before, don't really know how to experience pleasure in their life, aren't really, you know, they're, they're not living a life that's full of pleasure and joy. And, and so then you talk about the porn and you talk about the way that, you know, the sex that's unsatisfying, but women are participating in it. Women are, you know, conditioning men to sleep with them that way, are conditioning their relationship to be that way. So women have to recondition, re basically evolve our sense of self, our sense of femininity and sense of pleasure that we can experience in our body and then go into relationship, go into life from that place. So one of the things that we do, I focus a lot in my movement class that I do each week is to 
relearn how to create and experience pleasure in the body because a lot of women have basically turned that sense off mm. replaced it with learning how to please others whether that be your husband the authority figure whether that be your children whatever that is i'm here my purpose is to serve and please others where really the woman has this intense ability to experience pleasure and that's completely tied to her creative energy, her creativity, her power. In, in yoga and Ayurveda, the second chakra, which, you know, resides right about here underneath the navel point, it's, um, you know, very related to the reproductive organs. It is the seat of creativity. It's your womb. It's where the kundalini energy resides, goes down to the base of the spine and then rises up. It is um, where, you know, we talk about your cerebral spinal fluid and the spine, you know, it's all wrapped up in the same area, this pelvic area where all of this energy resides to be basically stimulated and used. And so the feminine has this enormous potential to take that and then do something with it, create a baby with it, you know? And so you think of a childbirth as being kind of a woman's role, right? To take in the sperm, get pregnant, hold the baby and birth it. But it's the same way with anything she does. It's the same way with a relationship. It's the same way with, you know, a business that she wants to create. It's the same way with a home. She takes it in, she takes a spark in, she holds it, she, you know, nurtures it, and then she brings it into the world. And women need to shift that. Women need to shift our ability to create in that way. That's, that's amazing. You're right. Uh, I, you know, I think one of the things we, we miss is that we don't think about creative energy that way. We don't think about um, like what you said. Uh, but I think at the same time, we need, we need a man. We need a man in our life to be able to create that home, to create that spark. So it's, it's a union. It's a back and forth between the two. Um, so, you know, the woman is powerful, but, but alone she's not. I don't think she's powerful enough to create what you just said. Yeah, I think about it, you know, in, in, um, in a metaphor, the, the male is the penetrator and the female is the receiver. And in that alchemy, then, you know, something can be created. So whether that's done within you or whether that's done in a relationship or in sexuality or in whatever it is, it requires all of life, you know, for the most part, 99% of life requires that alchemy of the male and female to produce reproduction and evolution. Yeah. So to create a gorgeous home or, or, you know, build together, you know, one of the things I noticed about my parents, you know, my parents met when they were very young. And uh, I think one of the things they had was what you're talking about. They both accepted each other for who they were. And my mom is a very powerful person, very powerful woman. And uh, when he was down, she came up. When she was down, he, like, it was this balance. And I was, feel so lucky that I was able to see that, you know. And I can definitely, hopefully, be able to implement, implement it in my life. Um, but, um, but I see that dynamic. And when we moved to the States, she never worked. She was the feminine, you know, housewife back, back in Iran. But when we moved to the States, she had to work. And she, at times, made even more money you know, and that was okay with my dad. He, you know, being a Middle Eastern man, usually there are those, you know, uh, stereotypes, they're too macho that, you know, but he loved it. He was like, oh, okay, great. You know, and he protected her and us and the kids and he gave her wings. He allowed her, he's like, you know, go off and, and conquer the world. And she did. And then at, at one point he was more in charge and more able to do that. And she, was behind him, you know, supportive. Yeah, go off and do what you do best. And, um, you know, some of the, the roles they took in the United States, like my dad back in Iran, he never washed dishes, you know, <laughs> he worked outside, it was very traditional. But when we moved to the States, my mom was working, he had to wash dishes and he was okay with that. He, he learned how to cook, you know, he, and so, so what you're saying kind of translates. I, I see the examples in my life. That's how I see it. Yeah. Well, they did a good job. They, did, they didn't stay in duality. They, they used polarity and they merged the two. Yeah. They, they filled in. So 
he he went to his feminine when it was required and she went to her masculine and then they flipped the paradigm and they, they, that's it, they did it. But it doesn't surprise me because the Iranian culture is still is based in an Eastern way of thinking and that's where all this came from. If you take, if you roll back the tape to India five, six, seven thousand years ago, then you get to see this being lived every day. So I think, you know, somewhere your papa embraced that Eastern way of thinking, even if in the culture of today, Iran's probably just as male chauvinistic as, as America is, he was able to reach back into his past cultural heritage there and pull up that, that essence because it's certainly there. It's, it's in all Eastern uh, cultures that this masculine feminine polarity play, that's, that's who, I mean, that's who started all this. This is who defined all this stuff for us. But it's, it's, you know, it's had 5,000 years of dirt piled on top of it because we've had this dominant uh, masculine, you know, bullshit, basically. I, it, I don't see. Div div division, I feel like is. is I, I just don't see it. I, I don't see the goodness in it at all. Yeah, and we're not evolving. And it's just, I feel stuck. I feel like as a society, we're stuck. Well, we're, we're gonna, if we don't change, we're going to come to an end. Our species is going to become extinct. So, I mean, it's, it's literally driven us to the edge of extinction. So yeah. I don't feel like I'm voicing an opinion here. It's pretty straightforward. If we keep doing what we're doing in 200, 100, 200 years from now, at least the scientists are telling me that we're, we're not going to be here. So, Well, 2019 uh, was the worldwide, we had the lowest uh, rate of childbirth. Yeah, sure. Maybe who wants to have a child when this virus is present? You can't even go to the hospital. You might die because you have to go to the hospital to give child or to have your child. You might get COVID-19 and die. That's so horrible. That's so scary. Yeah, I've had actually uh, a lot of friends who've had kids and thank God they're safe and sound. They're home. Uh, yeah, but uh, imagine right now with the division, if people, if women and, and men are single, how hard is it for them to meet now? They were hard. It was hard to begin with. But, you know, how hard is it now with COVID? To yeah. out, you can't go out. You got to do online dating. And yeah. Yeah. even with that, like, it's so controlled. Like, yeah. you, want, you know, the internet, you know, where I'm going on a date. So, and then even, I, I feel like, am I, be, am I crazy? Or like, if you go and do online dating, I know it's an easier way to meet people you don't normally meet. But at the same time, you have this company who has your information where you're going to go out dinner when, when your first date is it's weird is that am i wrong or i don't know it's very weird yeah i'm old enough to have you know, dated without all of that and you know it seems like nowadays people have more trouble getting together than they did back then so i i think you're, i think there's somebody's being marketed to with this online dating thing I, I, it doesn't seem to be making it any easier I, people, so. It seems to me like it's a product of our isolation in the first place, yeah. that people's um, anxiety around socializing, anxiety around vulnerability, anxiety around communication leads to a place that it's more comfortable to relate online. You know, somebody, I, I was flabbergasted at one point, somebody told me, you know, I went into my coworker's off office to have a meeting and she said, well, why can't we just do it over Skype? Oh my God. And we were in offices next door to each other. Yeah. Wow. And so that's as bad as it's like, I, I literally have this person in their flesh and their blood right here next to me, right? But if I feel unsafe in the presence of another person for whatever reason, because I feel insecure about this, insecure about this, threatened by this, da, 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 then it's gonna be a safer situation perceivingly to be over the internet, right? odd to me that is odd to me and i've had friends who have met uh men online and they've had an amazing conversation for a month they talk and back and forth back and forth they they feel like if they meet it's going to be sparks flying and then when they meet they have nothing to say or yeah. <laughs> well that kind of <laughs> when he's online behind the screen but when he's in person he can't connect well, because there's way more, because you're, when you're dealing with that online, you're dealing with just the personality. 
you're not dealing, you know, one of the main, um, main characteristics of pairing is smell. Oh, wow. And it's an unconscious thing. It's the smell of someone's pheromones. And so there's all of this subtle stuff going on in human existence that, you know, our rational minds are not aware of. So when you're just interacting over the internet, you're just interacting with someone's personality, but that's such a small part of who they are. And so that kind of brings me to a question. Um, if smell is so important, you know, right now with COVID, you know, we're not seeing each other. I feel like with the smell, it's not just, oh, I smell this person and I like them. It's also the sharing, the give and take. So we're not doing that. What is that doing to our growth or human um, evolution? Don't we need each other to kind of evolve as a group? Not like I... Yeah. I think... Two or three it's yeah. It's literally killing us. <laughs> I think there's two sides to it or two important ways. One is it's totally killing us because it's creating more isolation on top of isolation. And we talked about this last time in her last interview about the vagus nerve and how your health is connected directly. Most chronic health conditions are connected back to loneliness, back to isolation. And that's via what something called what we call the vagus nerve. And so isolation and loneliness create impair our nervous system functions and ties directly into almost every chronic disease that we know of. So this, so, go ahead. So this, what we're doing, staying home could cause a lot of depression or a lot of issues right after it's over and we go back yeah. to especially if it's done in certain ways. Now you also have the opportunity to, one of the things that this pandemic gives us the opportunity to do is to actually stay put and be, have, create intimacy with the people in our life that we may have been running away from by keeping ourselves busy. And so there's, there's that too. There's the opportunity to then reframe, rethink of what am I doing? What am I spending my time doing? Where, where am I going? Um, all of it, it's ironic because when this pandemic first happened, there was, there was a lot of um, climate change protests and things like that going on um, all over the world. And some of the main things that people were talking about that we would need to do on a mass collective level is like, stop traveling, stop driving cars, relocalize our economies, you know, all these things, right? And everybody's saying, no, 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 we can't do that. Nobody can ever do that, you know? And then the pandemic hits and all those things happen instantaneously. And, you know, it has a, a pretty big effect on the CO2 levels. And so, but what it also does is it gives you this opportunity to say, okay, so what I thought wasn't possible is possible. And I'm now in this, in this life where I'm home more. I'm with, you know, some people are actually completely alone, but a lot of people are in their family units, which is for some people a very dangerous place where there's domestic violence, there's, you know, all sorts of things. For some people, it's just an un unsatisfying situation because they've been working too hard or running away from the intimacy or not communicating. And so this is an opportunity to say, okay, how can I go deeper into both myself and my vision for life, the ways that I'm spending my time, the ways that I'm spending my money and who I'm with and how can I actually heal the relationships around me? Wow. Um, that's amazing. One of my, uh, uh, one of the comments here is says from James Mason, a friend of mine says before meeting in person, we're filled, we are filled with the idea of potential. Um, right. That's right. That's exactly right. And then you meet and potential goes off. Yeah. But I, I can't help but believe that because there's so much anxiety built in already because we don't even know how to relate to each other anymore. We don't know how to just really bring ourselves forward. Because, you know, I mean, like you said, if, you're, if you come off as a powerful woman, men are frightened of you. And yet, deep down inside, I, I would like to argue, and I, I may be wrong, I don't think I am, but I would like to argue that deep down inside of every man, he really does want to be with a powerful woman. He really does. And his personality or his ego may be frightened by it, but not his soul. I, I think the soul of every man 
wants to pair up with a woman who he knows has the power to project him into his infinite consciousness. And, you know, I teach it. That's what I teach in my classes. I've been teaching it for 22 years. Uh, I've never had a man really disagree with it. Like, you know, they may ask a few questions because of this new, what they would think of as new information might create a little discomfort. But once they get to know me and they've come to enough classes or just hung out with me a little bit, they almost always go, you know what? I'm with you. I, I would love to meet a woman who I could really just like go here, you know, like really be my partner in life. And I really trust you. Like, I really totally trust you to be my partner because man, you are so powerful and you are so exciting to be around. It's like, come on, we are, men get honest. We know that's what we want. It's not just physical beauty that we want. We want soulful beauty too. This is crazy. It's just crazy. And you're not going to get that through a computer. You're just not. So yes, you're, you're full of the potential. You're full of the hope. And then if you meet her and she, she may be a powerful woman, but if in her life, she's learned to dumb herself down. So as to not frighten the little 40 year old boy away, <laughs> then she comes to the dinner and plays submissive, you know, not submissive, but you know, meek. just a meek. And he's like, ah, you know, but she might not be meek at all. She might be this powerful woman. She's, she thinks if I come forward, you're going to run away. And just like a little 40 year old boy. And so, you know, and then he's like, thinks he's got to have a lot of money and be cool. And you know, all that, and, uh, how boring. Yeah. Coming together, making it together. You know, yeah. uh, one of the things uh, I hear in Western society is, uh, you know, you have to be a complete person. You have to be this and that before you meet someone. Yeah. And there was actually a rabbi who was, I forget his name. He's a famous rabbi or he's, he's written books about relationship. And he said he was on Oprah and Oprah said this to, to him. Wow. You're going to write a book about relationship. Make sure you write that the woman has to be healthy or has, has to be complete before he, she, and he said, no. He said, no. with her. He said, uh, yeah. I refer, I refer, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm talking over you. But yeah, he said, no, if, if you want to, if you're complete, then why do you need him? You don't need him. <laughs> well, as, I think Esther Perel is another one. She's got a, a whole segment, uh, was, was it Love and Desire, or what, which one was that? But anyway, she starts the whole segment with that. She goes, you know, I hear this notion, and she goes, if you stop and think about it, it's about the craziest notion you can even come up with because she said in a relationship, you're, 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 you're writing the story. What are you talking about? You, you have to have this interaction. That's what, that's what creates who you are. It's, it's in relationship that you learn who you are and who, how you go about creating who you are. It's in relationship that you do that. So how can you stay away from relationship and, and get to know who you are. You, you are who you are. You become who you are by being in relationship. She does a beautiful job of talking about it. It's, and I, tell, I buy into it completely. It's, it's as though our lives are stagnant, as though we've become something and now we walk around for the next 40 years and never change. It's by meeting you and having dinner with you and making love to you and, and all of those things that I become who I am. You are, you influence and affect who I'm going to be tomorrow by the interaction we have today. So that's a crazy notion. I'm not a stagnant thing. I'm, I change every time I meet somebody, they influence who I am and I change accordingly. So how, how can that make any sense that I should sit alone? I don't understand that either. How could you change by yourself sitting in a, in sitting in a home without influence? We yeah. change by example we change by learning from each other if i'm doing something and i make the best way to do it and then i see it done in a better way faster way then i'm like oh wow you know if i hadn't met that person i wouldn't learn this i wouldn't learn you know exactly. you know and also with growth emotional growth personal growth yeah, it's, yeah. A it's, so it's, it's just a society that keeps trying to encourage us to isolate so that we lose our energy we become submissive we become depressed and then we're easily controlled. And the economy, boom. Yeah. It, ultimately it doesn't, but if you look at all the industries that are fueled from isolation and insecurity, it's 
enormous. Just look at the feminine, just look at the female, all of the industries that are fueled by female insecurity. Makeup, clothes, like uh, all that's, you know, did you, okay, I'm gonna, I have a, a bombshell for you guys. Okay. The number one tax revenue in the United States, what is it from? Makeup. Women's makeup. Second, yeah. second is oil and gas, number two. It's, it's above oil. So we, as a society, spend more money on makeup than oil and gas, which all, everyone's car in the world, back, yeah. you know, name it. You guys know how much oil we use in the world. Um, ships, trucks, you know. Right. Yep. Imagine how many industries would be out of business if women just felt good about themselves. Right. And, and, and that's, but that's a true statement. That's why, that's why the, you know, larger ones that be are trying to keep the, keep the masses in fear and keep control, you know, and people buy into it. We buy into it by, you know, accepting these roles. So nobody is a victim of any of this, but it's important to see that as long as we perpetuate these rules, as long as we perpetuate this psychological process with each other, that we're just going to get sicker, more unhappy, more unhealthy. Our environment is going to, continue to be destructed. All of these things are gonna to continue to spiral down and we're already in our sixth mass extinction. Wow. Yeah, because I feel what you just said remind me of the circle. Yeah. Like the, you know, we feed off of each other. It's, yeah, um, yeah it all, it's all connected. And uh, once we understand that and accept ourselves for who we are, then we can help each other grow and unite. And you know, there's this, there's this um, spiritual teaching, right, that everything's a mirror. And people think of that as like this esoteric thing that's just kind of a symbol, you know, symbol for something that doesn't really exist, right? Like the whole world's a mirror to me as if that like just is kind of a thing. But this is, this is why, this is really it, you know? The way that we relate to each other, the, the feedback that someone that I know and love gives to me is a mirror to me. The creation that I've created, what I've been willing to lead, the, the risks that I've been willing to take, the way that I've been passive, the way that I've been active, all creates the reality around me that is the mirror to myself. So it's not some kind of um, obscure esoteric thought. It's actually, it's a very true thing that we're always influencing each other in relationship. We can get into a pattern of communication and be in it for 10 years because we're each doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And if one day I choose to change the way that I respond to him, then the entire relationship then takes on a new dynamic if it continues that way, because then he has to change the way he responds to me. And then my mirror is different. And then that continues onward. So if we all start to do that, we all start to change the way that we respond. We start to change the way, the place that we make choices from, change the priorities in which we're living from, change the values that we're doing business from, then the mirror starts to change. Yeah, yeah I've heard about the mirror. I love that uh, analogy. I, I love how that, that's used in everyday life. I do agree with that. Um, yeah. Maybe we steal the concept of critical lover. What, what, what that was from Brene Brown, I think. Mm -hmm. Was it from? Yeah, it was. Uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't Brene Brown. No. It was, I remember. Uh, some psychologist uh, wrote somewhere. We picked it up, but we use it in our seminars and even in our just our everyday teachings around here. And it's called the critical lover, and it's the idea that you give someone in your life permission to be your critical lover. So the idea is that you know that they love you and that your well-being is foremost in their mind. They're not, they're not criticizing you in order to submit to you, or, you. Or, or anything like that, or just out of selfish desire whatsoever. So it could be a parent, it could be a husband or wife, it could be even a, a, a really mature child, you know, a daughter who's grown up who's like 30 some years old and if you're in your 60s. My daughter is 14 and she, she gives me advice sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, anybody, anybody you recognize that really cares about you and will put you front and, and center. Yeah. And then you, you say to them, okay, I, I give you permission to be my critical lover. It's kind of like what I was trying to say earlier between the husband and wife. I'm not going to, if you criticize me or you be my critical lover, I'm not going to turn on you and say, well, you know, get out of my house or I hate you or get out of my life or you do it too. You know, that's our favorite one, right? Somebody says, you know, you do something. Well, you did it too. It's like, like, what's the difference of that? Like, yeah, I still did it, right? I mean, come on. 
So we really love that idea too. We really love that thought of like you give one or two, or if you're lucky, maybe three people in your life, the permission to be your critical lover. And so you can get the mirror that way through them because you don't want to, you don't want to get the mirror from somebody who doesn't like, you know, who really wants to hurt you or make you submissive or something. You, that mirror is not, that mirror is like one of those distorted mirrors, you know, that makes you look really fat when you're not or really thin, you know, when you're not. So you don't want those kind of mirrors. You want something that truly reflects your, you know, yourself back to yourself. And so we call that the critical lover in our seminars or our teachings. Like that. That's, you know, I've had that. I think both my parents, my daughter, you know, they're both, all three of them are my critical lovers <laughs> where yeah. I can bounce ideas off of. And when I'm mistaken, you know, they let me know in a yeah. loving way, you know, and, yeah. then, and yeah. I learn and I grow from it. Like, oh, okay, wow, I could have done that differently. Um, yeah. I have a question from an audience member. Uh, they are asking, so then are we attracted to wounded partners that mirror our own insecurities? Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and that's a you know again I know like um, and a lot of people would think that's a bad thing because you can create a codependency there and absolutely for sure you can create a codependency but you don't have to and so you could you could help each other in that you know you could say I, I recognize the wound I see I know my wound and I so therefore I can be compassionate and empathetic to you and I. And let's be careful not to become codependent, but we could help each other heal, you know, because I understand it very well. I mean, that's no different than going to an AA meeting if you have an alcoholic problem, right? You're in a room full of people who have a similar problem and you get guided by a similar problem. And that, but you got to be extra careful. Like you got to be really upfront and verbal, I think, or sign a written contract or put a big note on the, the mirror bathroom mirror like don't become codependent yeah. around your the ill the the psychological problem and what's that going is we just teased about that it's uh in the eight things in that book we read by uh carolyn Nay. carolyn miss yeah she called that the wounded woundology, woundology. Don't, engage, don't engage in woundology okay so. You know, I think that that ties back to the critical lover because, and also to the isolation that we we're talking about in our culture, we've lost the concept of community or the experience of community mm -hmm. and relationship when there is relationship, which is a dying art. When there is, it's usually under one roof and privacy. And there's very little um, interaction in the intimate sphere of relationship with people outside of you that are neutral. And so people go to couples counseling, but by the time they go to couples counseling, you know, maybe it's too late or how good is the counselor or how much are both partners willing to reveal and all those things. Whereas there's a whole other way to do relationship where you can, where there can be critical lovers in your life that are neutral to your relationship. And how different would that be if your relationship were more open, were more out on a table, you know, for the world to observe and people in your life, community, you know, around you could help both people so that the woundology or the codependence, you know, it was harder to create and maintain because other people around you that are neutral to it can help support it. I love that idea. I think a lot of marriages would have been saved. A lot of families would have been saved if, if we weren't so secretive about things, you know, yeah. I think culturally we've been told, oh, don't, don't share, don't overshare you know, yes. personal ideas or personal uh, problems with people. So we're usually afraid to share. And uh, by the time we are ready, it's, it's too late or, you know, it's past that point where the love is gone and, and it's very difficult to bring it back. Like I remember seeing certain families who seemed so happy and loving and it was so sad when they ended. Yes. Know? Very sad. Uh, I, I think a friend of mine when the it was a fam sort of like a close family members that divorced and we had no idea that it was so tough and my parents usually help uh, other family members and I told them I was like wow why, why didn't you tell us my parents would have helped you guys and they respected them enough to listen if they had come forth earlier but it was seven years that they struggled with so many issues and it's like 
seven years and they didn't even come forth, you know? So, so I, I think that's something that we're missing, something you said about the Eastern culture, um, more unity, yes. uh, conscious. And I love how you guys live. You guys, a lot of you kind of live together, kind of like uh, the Eastern way. I grew up in a huge family. Uh, my dad has a lot of brothers and sisters, so does my mom. So when my grandfather died, they kind of moved in with us. So I was, I was, <laughs> I had, my uncles and aunts were like my teenage brothers and sisters. So I was spoiled to that. You know, uh, I had ice cream whenever I wanted. I had candy whenever. <laughs> wow, well, you're still spoiled. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know you well enough to know that. Oh, you think I'm spoiled, though. <laughs> um, but, yeah, yeah, I have a very loving family, so I feel so lucky. And one of the things my family is a little different from, the, from Iran is they're not traditionally, uh, they're, we're a uh, tribal family, tribal group. We're very ancient. Uh, it's, we're bacteri bacterian, and our family tree goes back 2,500 years. So, yeah. So I, I, I've been to the country where my dad's uncle lived, and they lived on a farm and had cattle and, and sheep. And I saw cows being milked when I was a little girl. So, I mean, that's my background. So, and it's very tight. And it's very close, and everybody, it's kind of, it can be annoying because everybody knows everybody's business. But, but they come together. If there is an issue, I remember when I was a kid, when there was a family issue, the, the husband would come screaming, yelling to my parents, and they would calm him down and get them back together. You know, there's a lot of that that, that we're missing in America. And I had that. And even, well, if you look at, Parts of Iran, even like Tehran, like the capital city, they don't live like that. It's very Westernized, very, you know, you yeah. know, very American, very separated. Yeah. Here, everything. Well, very if you look separate. at pretty much every issue that's creating the most mass destruction in the world, almost everyone, or maybe every single one, comes back to an individualist mindset. Mm. And the solution is on pretty much exclusively returning back to a collectivist mindset. So you look at nature, you know, they bring it full circle back to where we started at the divine feminine mm -hmm. and the feminine principle in, in, you know, the universe, so to speak, is nature. Mm -hmm. And nature is inherently collectivist. You know, it's, it's working in harmony and a symbiosis. You know, there's Obviously, there's still death and rebirth and all these, you know, complex set of things going on, but it's very, it's a symbiosis that's going on. And our individualistic nature or mindset, because it's not our nature, has destroyed or is completely destroying what's going on and what, what our nature is meant to be, because we are a microcosm of the larger natural ma macrocosm. So our nature is to be more collective, is to live in symbiosis with nature, is to live, you know, symbiotically with others, is to have the well-being of the masses and the well-being of others in mind, not just our own. And so, you know, that brings, like I said, back to the divine feminine, which is that, is the willingness and ability, or should be, to lead from that knowing. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. I mean, you guys are are a plethora of amazing information. I can't get enough of you. And believe it or not, we are, we've been talking for an hour. It's felt like five minutes. <laughs> um, and I'm excited. I would love to have you guys back on. There's so many other. You know, I was jotting notes down other topics that was that were raised through this conversation. You know, any closing thoughts? from uh, both of you before we head out. Any advice uh, during this time? Come and visit us soon. Yes. So, and I recommend for men to come out and uh, talk to Joe or Madison, Madison men and women, uh, if they want to learn more about Divine Feminine or how to be in relationship if you're having issues with your uh, loved ones, or even if you're single, I think if someone is single, they, they need help and they're not getting what they want uh, in terms of relationship, you can definitely be of help. Uh, one of the things I did with, uh, with you was uh, my Ayurvedic uh, 
reading, uh, health reading. Mm -hmm. uh, I think people right now, because we don't have work, that's another topic for maybe another uh, another time. But uh, I feel like uh, even with the Ayurvedic reading, you can you can tell people what kind of work they're destined to have. I think this is a time of transition. And if people are interested in doing that, to definitely contact you. I will leave the information below uh, on the YouTube channel. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank, thank you. you. It's good to see you. So good to see you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you.